we focus on the body in and of itself, feelings in and of themselves, mind states in and of themselves. But we don't make them the goal in and of themselves. We're trying to take them apart to see what, what they're made up out of, because we've been putting them together in all kinds of strange ways, ways that lead to suffering. They're like building blocks. And we've been creating weapons out of them, weapons that harm other people, weapons that harm ourselves. But they don't have to be weapons. So we take the weapons apart. See what we've got right here. We've got the body breathing. It has different postures. It has different elements inside. Earth, water, wind, fire. Thirty-two parts, and thirty-two is just the beginning. There are lots more little parts in there. And so you want to be with them as they're happening. The same with feelings as they arise. The same with mind states. We make them mean something, but in the past it's been unskillful. So we take them apart. Now we're going to learn how to put them together in a more skillful way. This is what it means when we say we don't take them as ends in of themselves. There's a tendency to fetishize the present moment. So if you can be in the present moment, everything's going to be okay. That's the, the mantra of the mindfulness movement. And there are times when you get tempted to say, well, let's just disown mindfulness entirely. At least the way it's been turned into a business here in the States. It's a shame because mindfulness is a perfect word for what the Buddha was talking about, keeping something in mind. We're not just to be here with the present moment, to accept the present moment. We're here to see what we've got here in the present moment. What are the basic building blocks, and can we turn them into a path, a path to the end of suffering? So we're not here in the present just to be in the present, or to say that this is going to solve all your problems. The beginning is to get into the present so you can see what you've got and then figure out how you're going to fabricate it into a path, how you're going to fashion it into a path. Because after all, the path we're following is something you put together. Even the way you breathe is something put together. You have an image in the mind of how the breath should be. But sometimes that image may be harmful. It's going to have an impact on how you actually breathe. If you change the image, say emphasize the out-breath, as Dr. Breath says. Don't pay so much attention to the in-breath, but be more careful to breathe out and get all the unhealthy air out of your lungs. See what holding that idea of the breath in mind does. Or with your feelings, how you relate to pains in the body. You may have some old, unskillful ways of fabricating pains. I mean, there is a cause for the pains to begin with. The body's just ready to create pains all, in all kinds of ways. But particular pains come up, and we tend to try to trap them in a partic particular way, or move them around in a particular way or we picture them to ourselves in a particular way. And that's going to have an impact on how we actually experience them. Same with mind states. Things come up in the mind. Some things come up and it's very easy to let them go. Other things come up and they have Velcro, or bigger hooks than Velcro. They just dig right in. There's a fascination with them. And we can fabricate those thoughts into all kinds of worlds. So the solution is to take these things apart and then learn how to fabricate them in good ways. Fabricate the breath, fabricate your feelings into a state of concentration. 
fabricate your thoughts into questions you might ask about where the stress is, what can you do to understand it, what can you do to figure out the cause, what can you do to abandon the cause. Those are actually useful questions. That's a good use of your directed thought and evaluation, the way the mind talks to itself. So the present moment is not an absolute. It's something that you're fabricating, and the goal of the practice is to learn how to fabricate it in a new direction, which means that you're using everything that comes up in the present as a means to a larger end. And you've been using it as means in the past, but this time you're going to use it with more knowledge and to a better end and hopefully with some more skill. The more knowledge you bring to these, these processes, the less suffering you're going to have. There's an interesting piece today, I saw today from the New York Times, about someone complaining about the mindfulness movement and its tendency to fetishize the present. And her complaint was that people don't get happy because of what they do. People get happy because of circumstances. And the solution to their problems is going to be, we've got to change society so people be happy. And the mindfulness movement is opposed to changing society or as an obstacle. That was her take. And it's one of those arguments where both sides are wrong. In other words, simply being in the present moment is not going to make you happy. But then trying to create a perfect society is not going to make you happy either. You look at the Buddha, he, if anybody could have created a perfect society, it would have been him. But he saw that it was useless. There was a time when Mara came to him. The question had arisen in the Buddha's mind, could it be possible to, to rule in such a way that you wouldn't have to create bad karma and that you could do nothing but good for all beings? And Mara shows up and says, ah, yes, do that. And the Buddha realizes that this idea of creating a perfect society is all a trick of Mara. Because again, you're using people for ends, and how skillful are those ends? And even if the ends are good, there's a tendency to use them as means in unskillful ways. And if you told people that things will be good only if society is good, people would die before they could find true happiness. The issue is not just accepting things as they are, it's learning that how to reshape them in a skillful way. Starting with learning how to reshape things skillfully within yourself. And at the same time, being generous and being virtuous. These are probably the two best things for improving society. We're never going to get a perfect society, but you find that the more wise you are in your generosity, the more consistent you are in your virtue, the more you create a better world around you. And it can be done without force, without imposing things on other people. Generosity and virtue are the yeast that gets into a society, makes them human. Regardless of what the, the structure of the society may be or the system may be, if people were more generous and more virtuous, things would be a lot less oppressive. And the people who are generous and virtuous are also finding that they create happiness for themselves. It's to their benefit. And that goes together with a practice of meditation. In the Buddha's image, virtue cl cleans your discernment, and discernment cleans your virtue. And under the term of discernment, the Buddha included the practice of jhanas and up through all the knowledge that you can gain based on jhana. And so as the two clean each other, he said, it's like one hand washing another hand or one foot washing another foot. Everybody benefits. And 
then you're shaping the present moment in a new way. We're not here just to accept things. We have to figure out, well, what do we have? Accept what you've got, but then figure out what's the best thing to do with it. That's what the path is all about. The present moment is a path. It's leading someplace. The question is, what kind of path is it? Where does the particular path you're on right now lead? If your mind wanders off to thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of lust, thoughts of anger, it is a path. But it's a path in a downward direction. You can, if you can develop thoughts of renunciation, compassion, goodwill, that's leading upward. If you can take your thoughts and talk to yourself about the breath, get more settled in the present moment, that leads even higher. So we've got the raw materials here. The problem is we've been, as I said, turning them into weapons. But you can take those same raw materials and you can turn them into medicine. That's one of the images the Buddha has. The Dharma is like medicine, he's like a doctor. And here you are learning to be a doctor yourself, taking the things that you used to use to poison yourself and figuring out if you mix them in a different way, they are actually medicines. So the present is here to be used. And the teachings are here to teach us how to use them wisely.